Well, we're going to start 2 Corinthians because we finished 1 Corinthians. That's how we do things here at the Old Vintage Church. So uh, buckle in because here we go. Now, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, follows 1 Corinthians, but if we're going to be honest, it's probably actually 4 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians. If you're confused, good. We'll get there in a second. Now, 2 Corinthians, same uh, situation. Paul writes this thing, writes this letter to the church in Corinth. Now, if you've forgotten, uh, Corinth, let's just do some quick history here. Uh, Corinth was completely destroyed in 146 BC, uh, completely ransacked, nothing left, tore it all down, nobody lived there. And then it's uninhabited till 44 BC, where Julius Caesar rebuilds it. Uh, By the time Paul shows up then in 49 to 50 AD, uh, the city is 80 years old. 80,000 people in the population, third most important city in the Roman Empire. So um, Rome, Alexandria, uh, Corinth. Corinth is that important because it sits on the Isthmus of Greece. So if you know your geography, uh, Mediterranean Sea over here, all of the east over there, all of the trade either has to go um, through that, that area, through that little bitty strait where Corinth sits, or it has to go all the way down and around. So what they would do is they would bring the ships in and park them in Corinth, and then they actually had jobs where people would take everything on the ship off and walk it across the strait and put it onto another ship to circumvent having to go all the way down and around. Or sometimes they'd get real crazy, and they'd put the whole ship on rollers and roll the whole ship across and set it back down in the water. So all of trade between the east and the west came through Corinth, which meant then a lot, a lot of money in the city, right? Because everybody was getting rich because of moving things and trading things, and so that is going on. On top of all of that, uh, because it's a major trade port, you have a lot of uh, different worldviews, different ideas, different religions are kind of converging there because this is a place where we're all coming in from the east, we're all coming in from the west, all these ideas are meeting, people are settling here because we can make money, uh, and then you have all of this convergence of different belief. Which meant then you ended up with a lot of weird religion stuff uh, going on, right? You got 26 different temples to 26 different gods and goddesses. Uh, the Temple of Aphrodite is there out on a hill. Uh, temple of Aphrodite was a sex cult. Sorry if you have kids or they're in the room. Uh, there's a kids program downstairs. You've been warned. Um, so sex cult, uh, they had all of these prostitutes that would live there. And then when the sun would go down, the prostitutes would come down out of the temple into the city. Um, and then they would worship in the city with the men. Um, and that was like accepted as part of the culture. Nobody batted an eye at that. It wasn't like, it wasn't weird. It wasn't considered cheating. It was just welcome to Corinth. Uh, in the context of that, then in the whole overarching thing was in, in Roman culture, everybody knew Corinth was nuts. They made a word up, uh, Corinthianize, which meant to, to be like really, really worldly for the Roman people. Like, not not for, like, Jewish, uptight, legalistic, Jewish, super religious mono. We're talking about, like, the people who, uh, like, the Caligula crowd that was doing all of the orgies and all the weird stuff in Rome, they were like, Corinth is crazier than anything we're doing. We need a word to describe people who are acting like that, and they made this word up for it. Now, in the midst of all of that, you know, Jesus dies and resurrects. It happened. It's a thing. Uh, so, when he comes back from the dead, that tends to turn the whole world on its head. Because if you don't know, people don't come back from the dead. Uh, that's not a normal thing in the world that we live in. If your grandma dies, she went home. She's not going to show up on Tuesday and be like, oh, what's for dinner? Uh, so when Jesus does that, people tend to talk about it, which then, well, why did he do that? Well, he said he was God, and he said he would do it. Then he did it. So well, because he's a God, we should probably worship him. Yep, because he is the one and true and only God. And he said the only way to the Father is through him. So if we don't worship him, then we're all going to stand, uh, you know, accountable for our actions. So we probably should worship him. And that went out into the Roman world. And so all these churches start to spring up. And so Paul then starts to do that. Now, Paul shows up for the first time in Rome in 50 AD. That's when he rolls in for the first time. Uh, that's in the book of Acts, shows up, preaches, teaches. 51 uh, AD is when he gets taken before uh, Galileo there in Corinth uh, by the, you have, remember we had the evil Judaizers, there was that dude, uh, Sothenes, if you were here for our stuff on Acts, so Sothenes is this Jewish priest who uh, doesn't like Paul and tries to run this whole thing through that Paul is not actually a uh, 
he's not really preaching anything new. He's just taking Judaism and perverting it. But we should actually be doing and keeping all of the old Jewish laws. And Paul's uh, whole doctrine about grace and this thing that he's preaching isn't true. And so Paul has to go argue that and all of that jazz goes on. Uh, so Paul, of course, wins. But it creates uh, this group of people then who will then follow Paul throughout his career uh, this group of Judaizers that will go from him from town to town to town to try to disprove what it is he is saying because they're so frustrated by what he teaches. Uh, 52 AD, Paul ends up in uh, Ephesus for a, a clip. While he's there, he uh, writes he writes the first letter uh, to them in Corinth. Now, that first letter that he writes is referenced in 1 Corinthians 5. It says the previous letter. So if you're doing the math on that, you're like, hold on, this one's 1 Corinthians. How can there be a previous letter? <laughs> now you know. And if you're sitting there going, well, why don't we have that? Because we don't. Because God, uh, we believe, decided what books would be in the New Testament and what books wouldn't. So it's not that we've like lost something in history that, oh, no, now we don't know what it said. It's because whatever he wrote back, God was like, hmm, that one's not as important as 1 Corinthians is going to be. But he writes them for the first time, then in 52, and says, hey, figure it out. Uh, then we get to 53 is when he, because they're still having issues in uh, Corinth. 53 AD, Paul's still in Ephesus. He gets a letter from Chloe. Hey, Paul, it's a mess. This was 1 Corinthians. It's a mess. Uh, we have this dude who's in a sexual relationship with either his mother or his stepmother. We're not sure which. Uh, and then the church is like cool with that, and they're celebrating it. Not sure how to handle that. So if you could send some help, it would be great. Uh, hold on. We're not done. Uh, we're also, we're, they're having uh, big kegger parties for, and calling it uh, communion. Um, and then everybody's bringing their own alcohol and their own food, and they're getting um, smashed and eating till they can't walk, and they're eating and drinking in a way that uh, people who are in poverty or who don't have anything, they're not able to take communion because these sloshes are drinking everything that's there. Hold on, we're not done. Um, they're, they're also, during services, the women are screaming at each other across the sanctuary, trying to figure out what it is that they believe to the point that we can't hear what the preacher is saying. So if you could figure that out, that would be great. Hold on, we're not done. Um, they also have completely circumvented all of the spiritual giftings that you told us about, and they're only focusing on speaking in tongues and prophecy, but they're not doing it in a way that like we think they're supposed to be doing it. Like They'll be preaching, people are just screaming out in tongues and all kinds of different languages. Some of them are actual languages. Some of them are not. We don't know what's going on with her, but she's over there doing that. And then these people are prophesying, but they're not prophesying separately. There's like three or four people who are standing up, and they're all trying to out-prophesy the other person. We don't know what's going on, Paul. you got to fix this mess. That's 53 AD. Paul gets that letter, and he's like, so he writes 1 Corinthians back and goes, hey, this is how we're going to handle all of this. This is how we're going to deal with all of that. And you would think, well, 1 Corinthians would have solved the problem, except then in 54 A.D., Timothy shows up to Paul and goes, hey, you just came from Corinth. <laughs> it's a mess. Nah, not going good there, Paul. Things are, uh, things are falling apart uh, there. So uh, if we can figure out what to do about that, uh, that would be, be great. So then in the spring of 54, Paul returns uh, to Corinth, goes back, uh, he references it as a sorrowful visit because when he shows up, he sees that all of the correction he sent in 1 Corinthians, they have not stopped doing. Uh, they're still doing most of it, and so he it breaks his heart, and so he leaves, right? He leaves, and then we find out in 2 Corinthians, he tells them that he's decided not to come back because of these crazy things that they are doing. Now, uh, at which point he goes back to Ephesus. When he's in Ephesus then, uh, the end of 54 AD, Titus shows up, who's another one of Paul's disciples, and he goes, hey, Paul, I know Timothy upset you the last time he came from Corinth, and I'm not here to rain on your parade, uh, but it's still a mess in Corinth. Things are still not going well. So Paul writes a third letter called the Sorrowful Letter to the church in Corinth. We don't have that one either. You're like, well, what do you mean we don't have it? We don't have it. It's lost. Lost in antiquity, they say. Again, if you're like, well, don't we need that to understand the text? Nope, we don't. God decided what we needed and what we didn't need. All we know is he wrote this letter back to them that is called the Sorrowful Letter that he wrote back and says that. He references it in 2 Corinthians, so we know that it exists. So then summer of 54, after he writes that letter, so this is all like right on top of four-year time, right? Bing, 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 bing. 
Summer of 54, then, is when the riots happen in Ephesus. Remember, Paul uh, converts, <laughs> this is so Pauline, Paul converts so much of the city to Christianity that the um, underlying economy is so affected, the people riot, because they are worshiping like three different gods in the city of Ephesus, and there is a whole economic system built around making little idols that go in your home that everybody has stopped buying because the Bible says you're not supposed to have any other idols. So like, we don't need those idols anymore. So then the idol makers are like, Paul is ruining our life. So they, they have this big meeting. They all get together. All of these people are screaming and yelling. There's a big riot. They run Paul out of town. Paul has to flee from all of that. That's in 54 AD. Now, as he's uh, leaving, then that was when Paul starts his journey down the run towards where am I supposed to go next? So in the midst of all of this drama and all of this garbage in Corinthians, Paul is also dealing with his own life because he's now run out of Ephesus. This is when he uh, starts to head down towards Troas. Uh, he keeps asking God if he can, can I, I want to go over there where the people are. And, and God's like, no, you got to go this way. And Paul's like, there's nothing over there. Do what I say. We're going there. Right? So he ends up in Troas, which is like on the end of the run. It, there's nothing left but ocean. So just sitting there like, all right, here I am in Troas. I'm at the end of my back's against the wall. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, where I'm supposed to go. And that's when he has the vision that he's supposed to cross over into Macedonia for the first time. And so Paul does that, gets his first Macedonian convert. At that point, while he's in Macedonia is when in March of 50, January to March, somewhere there in 56 of AD, Paul writes 2 Corinthians back to this church. Now, here's the thing about 2 Corinthians. It is an emotional roller coaster of a book. It is all over the place with Paul's, uh, the way he writes it and what he says. It is not one of, the, it's not Romans, okay? So we're not going to get into a book when we go through this where it's like eloquent and, you know, this is like a Christian manifesto about theology and what we believe and why. This is the heart of an evangelist on full display at the frustration of people refusing to stop being um, goofballs because I'm not supposed to say turds. Like, that's where we are when you start to read through 2 Corinthians, is you really start to see Paul's heart and Paul's frustration of, I, I am at, at wit's end with you people. I don't know what else to do. We've convinced you of the resurrection. You have this church. You're trying to do what you're supposed to do, but we're still dealing with all of the same garbage. And I've been multiple times. You're still listening to people who are teaching things that aren't true. I don't know what to do. And so he starts. 2 Corinthians, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He says comfort 47 times to make your brain hurt. I want to focus this morning on the God who comforts us in our affliction so that you're able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So what is our affliction? Right? We're going to talk about suffering this morning. Now, here's the thing. When this gets taught and when this gets looked at a lot of times, when people start to talk about Christian suffering, we immediately make it worldly suffering. My finances are a mess. My relationships are falling apart. My health's on, on a, the skids. Like, things aren't going well. I'm not happy. I'm full of anxiety. I'm, I have worry. I don't know what's going to happen here. What's going to happen there? I'm alone. I'm depressed. I'm me, 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 me. Except Paul's not writing this to an unbeliever. So there is a thing that we have to concede as believers is the idea that those things, while there is suffering found in them, right? Like if your body hurts, that's not a fun life to live. Nobody's like, sign me up and give me some more. Nobody wants that experience. Or if your relationships are falling apart, or if your finances, all of that is suffering. Your approach and the way that you see that should be different than somebody who doesn't know about Jesus. From this place, if your life has been just dealt a hand of suffering, and there is no eternity after it, then it's not fair 
and it's sad, and it's broken, and it feels hopeless. But if you believe in Jesus, the suffering that you face here on earth is just finite. And even though it feels like it's overwhelming and there's no hope, there is, the hope is eternal life with Christ, freed from the brokenness of this world. He's not going to leave you in any sort of affliction that you're carrying from the physical world. So when Paul writes and says the God who comforts us in our affliction so that we're able to comfort those in any affliction, what affliction is he talking about? Well, the affliction Paul is talking about is the stand that you have to take for your faith and how that's going to affect you in the world you're living in. These people in Corinth are in an incredibly pagan society. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings this morning, and I hope you're buckled in and ready, but <laughs> you're in a very pagan society. The society outside of here, now I know you old schoolers are like, this country was founded on Jesus, and if you don't shut your mouth, I'm going to slap your bald head. Now listen, America is not a Christian nation. We are a post-Christian nation. That's what we are. That doesn't mean that there aren't good Christian people inside of the nation. What it means is that the majority of this nation, and it's a slim margin, but the majority of this nation does not believe in Jesus. They do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus. They do not believe in the restoration of Jesus. They have come up with their own weird, postmodern, humanistic worldview to say they've had it all figured out and they don't need anybody telling them how to live. We can do whatever we want, however we want, whenever we want. And the outcome of that, that nobody wants to talk about it, is heavy depression, heavy anxiety, high suicide rate, and broken marriages. So score, you're winning, you're killing it. But that is where we're at. So when you read that it says uh, he is a comfort for us in our affliction so that we can be a comfort to any of those in their afflictions, and he writes that to a society that is surrounded by paganism, you should wake up and go, this could apply to us. We could take this and apply this to ourselves. So how is he a comfort in our affliction? Well, if you live in a world that says you should be able to do whatever you want, and you serve a God that says, <laughs> no, you can't. And then you live your life, and you go about your daily business. And when your friends or your family go, hey, you want to go do this thing, or you want to go do that thing, or whatever, you go, hey, ask for me in my house. I serve the Lord. I'm not living my life that way. I'm not doing that. You can do what you want. Like, I respect you and love you enough to let you do what you want. But, baby, you need to wake up and pay attention. There is one God who died and resurrected for the forgiveness of your sin, and there is only freedom from who you are through him. So you can live how you want, but the only way you'll ever be complete, be happy, find your place, find your purpose, is at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't think that's going to rub people the wrong way in this world, and some people are going to be incensed and want to tear their clothes and march and throw things at your head, <laughs> you better wake up. You better wake up. You're going to face persecution for it. You're going to face frustration from it. You're going to have people that will be like, I don't like the way that you say and do things. It's not tolerant. You're intolerant. You're a bigot. You're angry. Why are you so angry? Why won't you just let me do whatever I want? Like a petulant child. I don't understand, Dad, why I can't eat the whole cake. It's not fair. Well, then eat the whole cake, you moron. Watch what happens. Go do the thing that you think you want to do that we're trying to protect you from and care for you from. Right? That's not, we're not, Christ is not saying you can't live and do whatever you want. Christ is saying that if you do as I called you to do, then you will find purpose, meaning, hope, and peace. You live in chaos and you're mad and frustrated, full of anxiety, and feel like life doesn't have a purpose. God answers all those questions for you, but you don't want to come do those things because to do those things, you have to submit your will and give up certain things so that you can be the thing he wants you to be. I don't really understand it. So in the midst of then that stance in doing that, what this says is God is a God who comforts you in that affliction. In other words, hold the line. It's not going to be easy. It is going to be suffering. It's not going to be fun. But God's not going to leave you out there by yourself where you feel like there's no payoff for me doing this. God will speak to you. God will comfort you. God will provide for you. God will give you supernatural strength. God will give you the ability to stand in the fire. But the real part of this that's powerful when you think about an opening to a letter to somebody is so that why does he do all of that? So you're able to comfort those who are in any affliction. Now, there's a big difference between the word our affliction and any affliction. 
If you allow God to be a comfort for you in your desire to submit your will and not do things the world has deemed okay that God has deemed sinful, if you do that, then you can become a comfort to somebody in any affliction. Well, what's that mean? Well, let's go back to what we talked about when we started. When you think of suffering, what do you think of? Uh, Health suffering, physical pain, hurt, my body's not working right, Uh, relationship pain, he's a jerk, I hate him, I hope his head explodes, Uh, financial strain, how are we going to pay the bills, how are we going to do these things we're going to do? need to do, status strain, like I've messed my life all up, I don't know, I'm never going to be able to get a real job, I'm never going to be able to rise above the things that I've done. Now, Those are the afflictions that the world is carrying with them. And what the enemy of this world wants to do is make that affliction so big in somebody's mind that they don't ever focus on the fact that that's a physical problem, but there is a metaphysical God who is bigger and larger than all of that. And if you can take your eyes off the thing that is right in front of you and put your eyes on the thing that you should put it on, then these trivial things stop mattering because now you know who God is. You can be a comfort to someone in any affliction because you have found Jesus. Well, that's what I've been saying, Pastor Pat, all along. I work with these idiots at work. These morons come in on the weekends and they get, they're all hung over and their lives are a mess and they're all sleeping with each other and cussing like sailors and watching those R-rated movies at night. They're out there in the bars drinking like fish. And I just tell them, I'm like, you just need Jesus. You need some proper Christianity in your life. That's what you need. You're missing the point. That is not a comfort to someone in affliction. If you don't believe me, the next time someone you love hurts themselves, run up and tell them they did. Right? You teach your child to ride a bike. Your kid falls off the bike and skins his knee. Instead of running up to your kid and picking him up, hugging him, kissing their boo-boo, oh, it's going to be okay, baby. Is this skin? It's all right. We're going to spray a little something, put a little Band-Aid on there. Every, you're be, well, just walk up and go, that hurts because you're dumb. You rode the bike wrong and you fell and now you're reaping the reward of being an idiot. Next time, don't ride the bike like that. Ride the bike like I ride the bike. I never fall. And then just right away, just waving at him. Ha ha, I'm on my bike. See how that goes. See if your kid's like, I feel better. I feel better. I am now inspired to ride my bike and try harder. No. No. It says you can be a comfort to them in any affliction. Well, how do you be a comfort to them in any affliction? You, go, you walk up and you go, excuse me, this thing you're struggling with, <laughs> I struggled with it too. And furthermore, I'm still in that fire. Now, that's the thing you want to hear a lot from Christians, but I'm going to tell you this. Sometimes God doesn't answer the prayers the way you want them answered. I know a lot of people that we prayed for healing for that God just took them home to Jesus. Right? And they stood in the middle of their affliction. Paul himself in 2 Corinthians will say that he has a thorn in his side, that he's prayed to God multiple times for God to take, and God won't take it away. Right? Because sometimes in this broken world, you just got to hold the broken. But guess what? There's other people going through the same thing. And if you can say to them, like, listen, this cross I'm carrying, you're carrying it too, and it's not fun. I'm not excited about where I'm at. This isn't easy. And I'm praying and asking God for healing, and I believe God can heal, but he may not. But if he doesn't, then glory be to him, because to live is Christ, to die is gain, and I'm going home to heaven. You want to come with? You want to come with? We can just hold each other's hands and suffer here on earth and just know we're waiting in line to when we can get to heaven and be like, hey, thanks a lot for the affliction, God. What the heck? How come I drew that card? But he won't ever leave you or forever, ever forsake you. And then furthermore, if you can do that, then that person who's isolated, who's alone, who's depressed, who's full of anxiety, who feels like nobody understands where they're coming from, well, guess what? They're not anymore, alone. They're not isolated. They don't feel like they don't have a voice or nobody understands because they've got a Christian brother or a Christian sister standing alongside him going, hey, kid, I'm going through the same thing. You're not by yourself. Broken marriages, those things that go along, you know who speaks best of that? People who've survived a broken marriage. Listen, if you've been divorced or you're going through divorce or your marriage is falling apart, the last person you want to walk to is June and Beaver Cleaver who have like the greatest relationship ever. Well, I don't know. I mean, my wife and I never fight. We get out of bed and it's rainbows and bluebirds. It's amazing where we're at. She cleans, I go to work. It's wonderful. 
You're like, shut up. I get out of bed and want to hit him in the head with a brick. We're both plotting ways to kill each other. We haven't talked in two weeks. He sleeps upstairs. I sleep downstairs. We might as well put a bed in the living room. That's where he's at all the time. Well, then who speaks better than that than the couple that walked through that? You're really gonna, are we really going to pretend? This is, are, we re, uh, are we really going to pretend like Christian couples have got it so figured out that they don't have to have fight like unchristian couples? Like, well, listen, I mean, ever since we found Jesus, it's been wonderful at home. We just never have a problem. No. We fight the same way. You think Amy and I haven't had throwdowns where it's like, I'm sleeping in the truck. You don't own a truck, stupid. Shut up. <laughs> no, you're a human being. But in those broken relationships, you know what helps? Having somebody who's walked through the same mess who can come alongside you and go, hey, you need to calm down and breathe. You need to think through what you're doing. Here's how Christ can help you in the midst of that. Here's how it helped in my relationship. Here's what we did. Here's where we're at and why things work. At the end of the day, God gave her to you or gave him to you. You're better off with somebody. You don't want to be alone, so you got to figure out how to submit to her so she can submit to you so that you two can function. But that only happens if you lean into these verses, what we have here, that you need somebody alongside of you who can be a comfort in the middle of those afflictions. Because until we can deal with basic uh, physical pain, suffering things, it's hard for someone to go, let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about the real affliction. It doesn't work. You can't show up to somebody in the throes of a broken marriage or drug addiction or money greed issues and be like, hey, you know why you're doing all of this? Because you don't love Jesus. If you love Jesus, it wouldn't be like that. They're just going to look at you like you're a moron. They're like, I don't even know who Jesus is. I'm supposed to love this thing that I don't even know what it is. And you're telling me if I love this abstract idea that my marriage that I'm living in, which is torture, is not going to be torture anymore because now, and, and listen, here's the dirty little secret. <clears throat> That's true. Yes, if you love Jesus and you really commit and submit your will and your life to him and you go after him, everything in your life that is a disaster will fall into place. God will restore and fix everything. That's what he does. That's what he does. But you can't approach people that way because they don't have any basis to understand what it is you're saying. So instead you have to say, my marriage was a mess and we fixed it. How'd you fix it? church. Church fixed your marriage. Well, I know it's weird, but we started going, and we just started listening to this idiot scream all the time. And then we started reading our Bible, we started praying, we started thinking, and, and over time, yeah, it was weird. As we discovered Christ and discovered who he was, what he had for us, what he wanted for us, as we begin to pray, we begin to submit our lives to it, these issues that we were having, suddenly there was an answer for why they were issues and how to fix it. Because we submitted. Because we did that. Well, that resonates way more to somebody than if you go, <laughs> you just need a little Jesus in your life. You are the little Jesus in their life. And the only way that you can be that little Jesus is if you be honest about who you are and what you're walking through, if you share your affliction and your suffering so that they can kind find comfort in what God has done for you. Now you go on, verse 5, for we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort. When you experience which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that you, that as you share in our suffering, we also share in our comfort. You are not alone. Remember, this church is kind of falling apart, and it's a mess. People are believing all kinds of, fuss, of false stuff. They're going off the rails. He wants to, like, look, we're all going to suffer this together, we're all going to be comforted together. You are not alone any time in your life that there is something that leads you to a place of isolation. That thing is sinful. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't care. That's what's true. 
That's what's true. And I know in the world we live in where truth is subjective and relative and whatever you say, if it feels good, <laughs> you're not wrong, it, which is the what, but that's not how this works. There is true and there is not true. And what the enemy wants to do is isolate you. I mean, we can go back to Gospel 101. Here's Gospel 101 in case you forgot. God created human beings with free will out of nothing. There was nothing. God created us and put us here. When he created us, he gave us free will. Free will is the ability for you to choose to do what you want. Meaning then, you can choose to be really, really good, or you can choose to be really, really bad, and then there is a whole non-binary cross the middle of that on where you're going to land. Like, you may be sort of good, sort of bad, in the middle. Who knows? You're just, it's chaos. Look, here we are. We can make all kinds of wild decisions. Now, those decisions, those choices that you make have a consequence. In God's original design, you were made to be in a relationship with him. He put Adam and Eve in the garden, gave them jobs, was with them every day. That is, there's no isolation in that. They were never alone. They always had each other and they had God. When they sinned, when they made the decision to go this way and do whatever they want, they ended up where? Isolated. God put them out of the garden by themselves. You are separated. You are away You are not with me. This is not where you're supposed, you did this. You made this choice. And then that isolation leads to death, decay, hurt, pain, suffering. You look around and go, well, why did God make diabetes? He did it. We did. Diabetes is the eventual happening of people who reject what God had for them. Why did God make cancer? Why did God make pain? Why did God? Do? He didn't. He didn't. That wasn't his original intent. His original intent was you to be eternal, a, a part of him in you, living in relationship with him. Adam and Eve chose to sin. We're all born into sin, which leads to isolation and away from God. Now, in that isolation and out there, that's where the enemy talks. The enemy has already lost. Remember, this is Gospel 101. I know South Park has taught you that Jesus is going to have a wrestling match with Satan and we don't know who's going to win. That's terrible theology. Don't get your theology from South Park. Now, here is the truth. God defeated Satan when he created man. No, he defeated Satan at the cross. Wrong. Genesis 1, he creates everything. Genesis 2, he creates man. Genesis 3, they sin. And God says uh, to Satan, he says, you have bit the heel of Eve, you have wounded her in this way, but she will crush your head, meaning Christ will ultimately destroy you. It's prophetic. Not Christ is going to be bigger than you, and it's going to be the greatest WWE match of all time. We're not having a steel cage match. That's not, this thing is over. God has already won. To put the nail in Satan's coffin is the cross of Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection once and for all closes the door on Satan having any foothold on future reign anywhere. He is defeated. Period. He has no control over you. No power over you. He is not some evil entity in some stupid 90's scary movie where he's lurking in the background with big black eyes like... He is the enemy of this world and the enemy of you, and he wants to destroy you. But he can't destroy you spiritually from the place that you are eternal because God created you that way. So the only way he can destroy you is to work in the confines of the creation that God made. And that confine is leave you a victim of your own free will. When you sin, you put yourself in isolation. When you're in isolation, you're away from God. If you're away from God, you lose the blessing God has promised you, which is eternal life. So your whole life then, the enemy just wants to put everything possible in your path and in your vision to keep you in isolation, to keep you afflicted. Oh, here's health issues. Oh, here's marriage issues. Here's financial issues. Here's job issues, status issues, addiction issues. Lookity, lookity at all this stuff's in a mess. You're uncomfortable. Life's not good. You're not happy. You're upset. Things are bad. Look, 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 look at how terrible it is. 
And the cross of Jesus Christ looms ever present in the background of everybody like a giant beacon in the dark to say there is hope and freedom from the thing the enemy is trying to put in front of you. But we get so distracted and so caught up that we miss that thing. Now, Gospel 101 is if you want to get back to what was intended and out of isolation is through Jesus' cross. He died and resurrected. He said, I will die and I will come back. I will overcome death. There was no way back before then. There was only isolation. There's no way back. You can't undie, right? Like, you can't say to me, I'm planning on dying Tuesday. I'll be at dinner Friday. No, you died. You're dead. Done. It's fine. Boom. Gone. But Jesus said, I'm going to die on Friday, and we'll have church on Sunday. See you then. And his followers were like, this, this dude's nuts. What? But sure enough, come Sunday morning, stone's gone, Jesus is gone. He did it. He overcame death. He circumvented the track. He walked back through darkness. He came back and said, hey, you can come back to the Father. You can come home. And the enemy goes, no, you're afflicted. You got your your relationships are a mess. Everything's a mess. Your sexuality is a mess. You're addicted to things. You don't have any money. People don't respect you. Look at looky looky. Look, you can't don't go over there. Right? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Just stay isolated over here. Stay away. Which is why then when you start to think about your faith and who you are, when you start to process and go, oh, that is true. I, I end up in isolation all the time. My affliction puts me in isolation. I feel like nobody understands what I'm going through, the pain that I have, the hurt that I have. I don't know who to share this with, who to bear this with. Us. That's why God gave you the family. That's why God gave you a church. That's why God bound us together as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why Paul taught in 1 Corinthians, you're a body. You're not a bunch of bodies. You're one body. And everybody wants every piece of their body. Nobody's like, eh, I don't need my pinky. I'm going to hack that off and throw it away. Nope. Give me my weird pinky. It's mine. That's how the church is supposed to work. Give me the weird skeptics. Give me those that are questioning. Give me those that are frustrated. Give me those who are doubting. Give me the addicts. Give me those that are all screwed up in their sexuality. Give me all of those people. Bring them all down here to the cross of Jesus Christ. And he will take whatever garbage was in isolation and he will push it right through the filter of Golgotha and they'll come out the other side born and redeemed as God intended them to be. And that process is affliction. That process is suffering. But as you do that, he is the God who comforts. And the, com and the, the affliction that you felt over here pales in comparison to what now you are walking through here because he is forming you back into what he wants you to be. Paul ends these verses like this. Indeed, or he's like this. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we are so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. We're not sure what he's talking about. This could be uh, sickness he was going through, riots in Ephesus, imprisonment. Paul had a bunch of issues going on, but something went on in Asia. Asia is where Ephesus is. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. He delivered us from deadly peril and he will deliver us again. Think about that. Like, just approach your life that way. All the time when you meet people who are non believer, there is no hope for a non believer. Pastor Pat, that's not uplifting. No, it's not. You're right. It's because it's not. It's not. There's a reason why Christopher Hutchinson, one of the greatest atheists of all time, said life is nothing but an endless lake of hopeless despair, and then we die. What a feature. Let's put that on T-shirts and sell it. Join our group. But if you remove eternal life and you remove God and you remove hope for post this broken world, then what is there? Right? There, there's legitimate isolation death sentences. 
in this world where you go, life has no point, it has no purpose, it has no meaning. I've been dealt something I'll never be able to deal with. I'll never be able to get past. I can never get over this thing. I am that thing. This is deadly peril. What Paul is saying is Christ has overcome the world. This is why Paul can write, I've learned to be content in all things when he's chained to the floor of a prison. This is why when Paul's followers said to him, but Paul, what if you die? He goes, good. To live is Christ. To live is to suffer and to face the affliction he faced. But to die is gain. I want to die. Send me home. Get me out of here. Let the work be concluded. Let it be finished. I did what he called me to do. I was a faithful worker. I went where he wanted to go. Now put me to heaven. Put me on a lounge chair. Give me a nice drink in front of a pool. Pull up a history movie. Get Christ out here because I got questions about why he did the things the way he did them. But I'm done. That's hope. That's hope for people who go, this is rough. And you can go, baby, it is. It is rough, but he's not left you. He's not forsaken you. He's not forgotten you. He is a comfort in a very present time of trouble. He is right alongside of you, and he'll never leave you or never forsake you. And don't let the Western church mess your mind up. He not only is alongside of you spiritually, but his church is with you. You are not alone in the physical sense in that there are people who are a representation of him who love you and care about you, who want to walk with you through the affliction you're facing. So we got to get over this idea in this world. We can't be honest about who we are. If somebody says to you how you're doing, don't go, I'm fine, and then wander off. No, you're not. Your life's a mess. If they're stupid enough to ask you how you're doing, then you tell them. You want to know how I'm doing? My feet hurt. My back hurts. My body's not working the way it's supposed to. Can't feel this pinky. Don't know why. On a bunch of blood pressure medicine that's supposed to prevent stroke, but the long-term effects of taking that medicine is a stroke. Life's not good. At least then they know what to pray for you for. That's honest. They know what to do for you then. Until you can be real about what you're walking through, you don't really have any grounds to stand upon if you're frustrated that God's not fixing the thing you're mad about. The enemy wants you in isolation. He doesn't want you to tell anybody. He wants you to pretend like you can fix it. I'll get it together. I'll get it worked out. I'll, I'll, I'll get, whew, I can control this. I can do this. No, you can't. You, no, you can't. If you could, there's no need for Christ. Remember the progression here. He made you, gave you free will. Our free will has a consequence. The consequence of not choosing him is uh, not choosing him. So now we're in isolation. There's no way to get back to him because you've rejected him. So if there was a way to get back to where God intended you to be without Christ doing what he did, then there's no need for Christ. Like if there was a separate road back to God. Thanks, Jesus. I'm going to go this way. No, you're a train wreck. You're a train wreck, you're a train wreck. Woohoo, we're all train wrecks. Well, Pastor Pat, I'm not as. You are, you're a train wreck. If we bury everybody in the room up to their neck in dirt, like who's going to be the dum dum to point around and try to say who's the dirtiest? Well, I mean, I know I'm in it and you're in it too, but you're more in it. No! We're all afflicted. We are all bearing the weight of our isolation, and the only way back is through Christ. So this morning as we come to an end, there's really only two people in the world. And and it comes down to this every Sunday, but it's true. There's either somebody who's in isolation, who chooses to stay in isolation, frustrated they're in isolation, but refuses to come back and be what God intended, or there's those who've come back. Well, what if I'm on the journey? There's no journey. Pastor Pat, that's not true. There's plenty of programs out there called, there has to be a journey. No, there's not. You're not going to slowly come back. You're not going to be like, well, I'm going to do this and that, and then today's going to be sort of okay, and then look, i got this on, i got the right shoes, my hair looks nice, my pants are good, I've been going to church, I'm tithing my 8%, i got my right Bible, whoo, I'm good. No! Isolated, not isolated, Jesus. Where are you? That's why Jesus is so important. That's why that death and resurrection is so important. If you believe he died and resurrected, you go to this camp. But Pastor Pat, uh, what about my drug addiction? What about my sexuality? What about my broken marriage? Romans 10, 9. If you, you, believe with your heart, in here, that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, and is Lord, big L, 
then you will be saved. Isolated together. Jesus. I don't like that, Pastor Pat, because that means that you could live over there and be in sin. All right, yeah, read the New Testament. Go ahead and read the New Testament. We did all of 1 Corinthians. That should have been plenty of evidence to you. That whole book is written to believers, and there is some wild stuff in there. There's stuff in there about not having sex with your mom. Like, I feel like that's a given, but that was something Paul felt he felt the need to discuss. Written to believers, right? Not written and saying, hey, you weirdos, you're not getting into heaven because you're a bunch of perverts. It's like, hey, perverts, you're going to heaven. Stop being perverts. Because it's isolated or not isolated. It's belief or not belief. But then when you step into this place, there is comfort in knowing he is going to make you into a new thing. He's not going to bring all the affliction from what you were over here, and then you just have to keep carrying that affliction. Now he's going to get you over here, and he's going to smash you into smithereens. I don't know if I like this anymore. Yeah, welcome to the suffering. He's going to take everything that you've claimed is the most important thing in your life and crush it and make you into a new thing, the thing he intended you to be, what he wanted you to be. He's got to get all the junk and garbage knocked off of you so that you can be what he wanted you to be. And that may take a day, a week, a month, 10 years, 12 years, 30 years, your whole life. Your whole life may just be a testament that God never stopped working on that idiot. He was a mess at 20. When he died at 70, he was a mess, but God loved him the whole way. Because that's what he accomplishes and who he is. So you're not alone. He hasn't left you or forsaken you. He's not thought you don't count or you don't matter. He died and resurrected to set you free from sin. So let's go be a church who takes the hand of those in affliction, takes the hand of those lost in isolation and says, you are not alone. I'm with you right now, but I'm going to introduce you to a God who loves you as you are and loves you so much as you are, he refuses to leave you broken. He's not going to leave you where you're at. He's going to take you and he's going to crush you and reshape you and rebuild you. He's going to come at you with a razor blade and cut out all of the things in your life that are detrimental for you being like him. And he's going to form you into what he intended you to be. And that thing will be full of hope and joy and peace and understanding and self-control. Because God wants you to be what he wants you to be. He wanted it so much that he sent his only son to die so that you could live. God did not send his son to this world to condemn it, but to save it. Let's be that church. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you this morning. Lift up every person in this room. Lord, I pray over the next few minutes that you would be a big old wall of conviction in this room. Lord, for those who vacillate in isolation. That they keep saying next week, next week's when I'll get it figured out. Next week's when I'll do it. That, Lord, today would be the day that they embrace your cross. Lord, we're not talking about radical behavior modification. We're not talking about radical change in the way they do things or see things. What we're talking about is that they can recognize they're isolated, they're alone and unhappy, and they want to be happy, and they believe that you died and resurrected so that they could find that. Lord, we pray and we believe that you would liberate people from the bondage of this world. Let us see the work of the enemy for what it is. We are not our affliction. We are not our pain and suffering. We are not the things that we have to suffer through and walk through in this world. The weight of the brokenness of this world is overwhelming at times, but we serve you a big and loving, caring God. And you said if we come unto you and we lay our burdens down, you would give us something easier to bear. Lord, we pray that that would be true and resonate in the heart of every person in this room. Liberate people from isolation. For every believer in this room, Lord, those on the other side of the cross, Lord, I pray that you would put a fire in their soul to go be a comfort to any of those who are lost in affliction. Help us to always have empathy and compassion for those who are hurting and broken. Let us be understanding to a fault. Give us patience to deal with sinners. Lord, I pray that it would be open and accepting so that people can come to the foot of your cross and be transformed by the renewing of their mind. Lord, we thank you for what it is you're going to accomplish through each and every person in this room. Lord, we thank you for what it is you are accomplishing in the lives of believers here at Vintage Church. Make us into disciples. Make us into an army that conveys the hope of your cross to a broken world. You are a comforter. 
You are someone who understands our suffering, and you have never left us and will not forsake us. So we will go and do what it is you've called us to do and be the church you've desired us to be in order that we may reach those who are lost in darkness. Use us, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen.